hi everybody welcome to our next uh, uh episode i guess of our 2021 virtual vanderbilt summer science academy um it is just amazing to have you here um so today we have people uh presenting who have recently graduated with their phd from vanderbilt and are now in their next phase of, of training and career development. Um, so we are gonna get started with Rhonda Keston, who's gonna tell us a little bit about her personal story and her journey. And I am so excited to have you here. Thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here. All right, everyone, my name is Rhonda. Um, I graduated um, with my PhD from uh, Micro Post Interactions um, program in March of 2020, literally the week before everything shut down. So that was quite the experience, but I'm glad to be here with you today. Okay, so I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi born and raised. Um, I have one older brother um, and I think my love of science started in middle school when I joined the science Olympiad team. So basically the science Olympiad for, you, for those who don't know is basically just a competition where you're giving, given certain tasks like it could be building a bridge and your bridge has to hold has to hold like um, the maximal amount of weight or you have to figure out what disease this theoretical person is infected with based on like a prompt and symptoms and all that fun stuff. So that's where I think my love of science came from. So currently I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at USIS or Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Um, but it's kind of weird because um, they hire contractors through the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, which is a nonprofit that I believe was created in 1983 by U the US Congress. Um, so it, the whole goal of both of these organizations is to support the military and, um, and ensure that they have excellent medical care and that research, we're at the forefront of research for any issues um, that may arise, including infectious diseases that um, I'm working on. And so outside of lab, I like to bake. Um, I love to travel and I spend a lot of time oops, with this guy here. His name is Sebastian. We adopted him in January. So we've had him for about six months and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So in my presentation, I'm just gonna take you through these four points. So, um, and just basically describe how I became involved in research at each point. Um, so starting in high school. So as I stated, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi and my high school, which was Murrah High School, um, had a program called Base Pair. And it was a biomedical research program that paired faculty at UMC with um, students um, in the program. So um, basically, I had to just submit my transcripts and um, do an interview and basically just tell why I wanted to be in the program. And so at that point, um, I knew I liked science, wasn't really sure. Like, honestly, I didn't know much about research at all at that point. I think, you know, you hear more so about like being a doctor, being a physician. Um, but I was like, if anything, this will look good on my college application and, you know, help me in that way. Um, but at UMC, I uh, was in the Department of Microbiology in the lab of Dr. Mary Marquardt, and I studied the effects of pneumolysin on the cornea. And pneumolysin is um, a toxin secreted by streptococcus. And so basically we worked in rabbit and mouse models and um, determine the contribution of pneumolysin to disease. Um, so conjunctivitis and other eye infections that we saw. And so, um, and during that program, I was able to work um, in the lab for about like one class period a day. And then also I was able to work in the lab during the summers. And, I, and at that point I was like, okay, I really enjoy this research thing. I got to interact a lot with the grad students and the postdocs um, and my mentor. And it, it, it just like kind of clicked with me. 
And I was like, okay, I could see myself doing this. And so for undergrad, I went to Emory University. I have the degree to prove it, but I also have this nice pamphlet, pamphlet that I posed for. Um, one of my friends, um, his mother was the photographer for Emory and he recruited us to do these pictures. So yeah, that's me right there. So at Emory, I majored in biology and classical civilizations. And I was able to do study abroad for a summer in Rome, um, looking, um, studying art and architecture. Um, so that was a part of the classical civilizations major. Um, the reason I chose summer study abroad is just I didn't feel like I had enough time during the school year. Um, because as I'm sure all of you know, science majors can be pretty rigorous and time consuming, especially with the labs and whatnot. So um, I was a part of some organizations such as um, APO, which is a service fraternity. Um, I was a more mentor, which means I was um, the years I participated in the program, I was paired with the first year um, undergraduate students or freshmen. And basically it was just there to answer any questions like where's the best place to get lunch? Um, I'm struggling in classes, what resources are available to help me? So that type of thing. And so I also worked um, in a lab during undergrad for all four years um, as a part of work study program. So I got paid and then one semester, I believe I also did, um, um, I, I worked for class credit. So during that time I didn't get paid. And so it was, that was with the department of biochemistry in the lab of um, David Pallas. Um, again, I worked with mice a lot and um, looked at um, blood disorders and so it was a lot of like dissecting and taking out livers and being introduced to flow cytometry, that type of thing. So that was really interesting. <laughs> um, but I think the biggest takeaway for me for, from my undergraduate research is that, okay, it's not I'm not, I don't, I'm not super gung-ho about all science because I just felt like, oh, I, I enjoyed microbiology a little bit more. Those questions were just more interesting to me and that's fair. And I think it was a good time. Um, it was still a great experience because I learned more so what, what I didn't like, which is also very helpful. And so that brings us to um, IGP. Um, I started IGP in August of 2014. And so after grad, well, prior to graduating, I was still in my undergraduate lab. And honestly, I think I was just overwhelmed, like the idea of like, okay, college is ending, what am I gonna do next? And I don't recommend this, what I'm about to tell you, but I applied to one program and that was Vanderbilt. Um, I thought I would take some time off, do some traveling, figure out, find myself or, or whatever they, whatever you call it. Um, but my mentor in my under, undergrad lab, it's like, hey, just apply to a couple of places. Um, and one of those places was Vanderbilt because it was closer to home, about six hours from Jackson. Um, I liked the idea of the umbrella program because again, like I wasn't quite sure exactly what I would wanna do. Um, but I figured it out and I joined, um, I, after joining I, IGP, I did my rotations mostly in micro and immunology, um, which is now micro post interactions. And I ended up join, joining Tim Cover's lab um, at, Vander, at Vanderbilt and he's still there. So if you guys ever wanna like drop by and say hi, <laughs> but he's really nice. So if anyone's doing research in his lab, I think you'll really enjoy it. And so here I just put the title of my thesis which is Helicobacter pylori VAC A toxin regulation and strain specific differences in activity. And so in the next two slides, I'm just gonna like very briefly go over um, what I studied. And so for those who don't know, Helicobacter pylori colonizes the gastric mucosa of uh, 50% of the world's population. It can pers persist in, um, for decades undetected. Um, but it is associated with peptic ulcer disease and also gastric cancer in about 1% of um, individuals. And so the, again, this is just the brief overview of what I did during grad school. Um, and so 
the goal of Tim's lab is to determine um, what, how um, virulence factors impact disease. And so I studied this toxin here, and this was as a recreation from um, cryoium. It's called vacuolating cytotoxin A. And so I looked at different forms of this toxin to see how it impacted or affected host cells. Um, so mice, organoids, cell culture, et cetera. And then also another project was um, an in vitro project in where I grew H. pylori in a number of different salt conditions and determined how that impacted the bacteria. So that's why I got the little triangle. <laughs> um, so, and we found that um, in increasing salt con conditions that um, more of the toxin back A was secreted. But I thought it was important just to highlight to you guys that lab isn't all about being at the bench. And I feel like I've enjoyed my time in Tim's lab. I have nothing negative to say about my lab experience. Um, but also you make connections with the people in your lab and um, some of them became my best friends. Um, we would go to conferences together. We would go to lunches when we had summer students or um, rotation students, like at the end of their rotation, we would all go out to lunch. Um, something that un at, honestly at the time I didn't recognize was kind of rare um, was that I went to a conference every year I was in Tim's lab. Um, so he just, he, his philosophy of that is important that you learn how to speak about your science, interact with other scientists, make those connections. And um, I'm really grateful for that. And this is a picture from my defense. Like I said, literally the week before everything shut down. So if we knew what was coming, we probably all wouldn't be standing that close together. And so again, I spent a lot of time at the bench, but I also spent time away from the bench developing um, professionally and also figuring out what the heck I wanted to do with my life after grad school. Um, that included participating in uh, micro and in immuno GSA, Graduate Student Association. I was a VP one year. I was um, on the, um, um, the social committee one year. Um, so that type of thing. And then also I did a number of activities sponsored by the bread office. So I got to do a little bit of traveling thanks to the bread office, which is really cool. One being the federal STEM policy and advocacy trip. So we got to meet with um, um, policy professionals um, who are part of the Vanderbilt community in DC. We got to go to their office, learn about what they do. Um, and again, that was a situation where I learned policy is not for me, but it was still a great time and, um, and just uh, um, I just learned so much from that trip. Um, additionally, I participated in Biotech Day um, at Amgen in Boston and um, basically just got to share my research, learn about their company. Um, and then I also got to teach a lot, which I found that I really enjoyed to do. One was through IMSD, which was discovered by a medical research with, in which we taught, um, I believe, high school juniors or rising high school juniors just basic lab techniques um, and paired that with lectures. And then um, one long 12 hour day during the semester, I would participate in Weekend Academy at Vanderbilt and um, basically teach various topics um, to 11th and 12th graders. I think one time I taught eighth graders um, just about microbiology or specific lessons within microbiology. Okay, so the big question for me, like as you just saw, I did a lot of different, I participated in a lot of activities. Um, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to do a postdoc or not. Um, a part of me just was like, okay, I'll end up just going straight to working for a company or something like that, like, or do an industry postdoc. But I didn't know if a traditional academic postdoc was for me. Um, because I, I still don't see myself as a PI. I definitely enjoy the teaching aspect, but I have no desire to run my own lab. So that was just a question I was mulling over. And then I finished my PhD. At that point, I had some um, applications in the pipeline at various companies, had a couple of interviews that didn't quite pan out. 
Um, and then I had a meeting with Tim and he was like, okay, what's your criteria? Like, what would it take for you to go to a company, go to a postdoc? Like what's your, what's plan A, B, and C? So I was talking to him and I was like, okay, I think I want to do something more translational, uh, more directly related to human health. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, now fiance, lived in DC. So my thought was, I don't want us both to have to move if we don't have to, especially if it's not a job I see myself at long, long term. And so I was like, okay, I want to be in the DC area. So that gives me a lot of options between Maryland, Virginia, and, and DC proper. And so um, I ended up interviewing with um, Dr. Andrews um, at USIS. And I had never heard of USIS before Uniformed Services University. I was like, do I have to join the military to be a part of this? Like, what's, what are they all about? And I didn't join the military. I'm not in the military. Um, but we get to interact with our service members on a regular basis. Um, and so a roundabout way, I found her lab. Tim told me about USIS because one of his colleagues, not Dr. Jers, but Dr. Scotty Merrill, works at USIS. So I just went on their website, did my research, and then we just started emailing. I sent her my CV. We had a phone conversation, which led to um, a presentation I did over Zoom for the lab. And as of June 15th, I've been here one whole year, and it's been really good. So Anne's lab um, are looking at vaccines, animal models, um, and um, developing um, um, novel um, antibiotics and therapeutics. And they also do product testing for other companies. So very translational. Um, and my specific pro project fo focuses on um, Nasiria gonorrhea, and I'm developing um, a vaccine, an OMV-based vaccine and a whole cell irradiated vaccine and doing some preclinical testing for that. And so her lab not only works on gonorrhea, but also chlamydia and with the goal of eventually having uh, vaccine, vaccines for both. So why is this important? Why do we care about gonorrhea? So um, bacterial STIs are increasing drastically, not only in the US, but uh, across the globe. And specifically, when we consider gonorrhea, um, antibiotic, antibiotic resistance is increasing um, with, that pet, with that particular pathogen. And also, um, it can be very detrimental, especially for women if left untreated. It can cause um, pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease, which can lead to infertility. So this is definitely something we want to target. And so again, I'm just gonna briefly go over my research. And honestly, I can't even, if I wanted to, I can't share a whole lot, um, but just some general um, background. So atom membrane vesicles are these natural blebs. Um, so as bacteria grow, they begin to like bleb off these membrane vesicles. Um, so they contain um, antigens, natural antigens, such as atom membrane pro proteins, um, LPS, LOS, and then within the vesicles are cytoplasmic contents. And as far as the irradiated vaccine, why, why would we even want to do that? It's, it's basically a similar principle. It's just we're, we don't know which will work best, so we're doing both. And so here is an example of a virus particle um, in which you add um, this reagent called MDP. And it basically protects the um, outer membrane proteins from irradiation. And we're left with the, um, with the bacterial cell that's dead with its outer membrane proteins intact. So these are just two strategies we're using um, to eventually test um, as a vaccine. And here's just a brief overview of a timeline. So these experiments are fairly long because we have to immunize the mice. So they arrive, we allow them to acclimate, we immunize um, for this particular experiment three weeks apart. And throughout intervals, we collect serum and vaginal wash um, um, samples. Um, we have to add before infecting the mice, we have to um, 
um, insert estradiol pellets into their um, into their upper backs. Um, it basically uh, we do this because we found that in a certain phase of their menstrual cycle, so we're working with all female mice. Um, that they're more susceptible to infection. So basically these pellets just keep them in that stage that we want. And so we would then infect the mice and then for seven days um, do collect, um, do vaginal swabs and um, plate for CFU. And so what type of data are we getting out of this? Um, how do we know if it's working? And so here is just an example, we do Western blots. So we'll I'll run OMVs as our antigen on our Western and then use the serum that we collected um, throughout the study to determine if they're making antibodies against these antigens. And similar principle here is that we would use an ELISA-based approach to me measure antibody titers. And I believe this is just an example of IgG, one of the most common antibodies. Um, we would also look at clearance rates and um, CFUs. So again, just a quick overview. So am I, I'm not only, I guess, uh, similar to during my PhD, I just don't do one thing. Um, I get very antsy. So I like also just exploring, continuing to explore different career paths and be involved with the community I'm in. And so one way I'm doing that is um, I served as guest lecturer this past year for about two lectures um, for the molecular pathogenesis course. Um, in which I talked about H. pylori. Um, I'm serving as treasurer of the postdoc associ association. And then I'm also getting my project management professional certification. So I'm studying for that. And one perk of technically working for a nonprofit is that I have access to all these courses online for free. So that's really nice. And I think that leaves us plenty of time for questions. So that's all I have. Thank you so much, Rhonda. I, 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 while others think about questions, I have one. Do you know what you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> so the, I do want to, I, I want to be more on the project management side of things. So like scientific project management for companies. Um, so that's where that's where it's leading me. And then I don't see myself only doing that. Like I definitely would still love to volunteer, especially with like high schoolers or um, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds who are interested in science and just serve as a mentor in that way. That's wonderful, wonderful. Ellen, I see you've got a question. Oh yes, yes, very much, just glitch. Yeah, so I was I was having a similar question about what you want to do in the future, and like you answered, you want to do the project management and science, and I was just wondering, um, I guess how did you come up to that decision, and what were the experiences, like? The yeah, yeah sure. Um, so I came to that decision honestly because I was just stressed out about it. I was just like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Um, because the issue is like, I really enjoy a lot of different things. And I came to the conclusion, I don't have to do only one thing. And you guys don't either, you, you can do multiple things. So I kind of just wrote out a list of what I liked about being in research and um, those aspects. And I came up with teaching. And I came up with actually like planning the experiment, organizing the experiment, and communicating my science with others. And that kind of fell into the project management role for me. Awesome, there's a question in the chat. What's the difference between an academic and non-academic postdoc like what you're doing? Can you kind of identify some key differences? From what yeah, you um, yeah, for me, it's fairly similar. Um, um, it's fairly similar, I guess for my specific lab, but this isn't the case throughout uses, it's just my lab because we do a lot of product testing and uh, with uh, materials that are patent, like I can't take this with me. And that was a discussion I've had with my um, PI beforehand, um, because if I was interested, she said, hey, we can figure out a project. You don't have to do this proprietary work, but I chose to do this because this is what I was most interested in. And I know that I don't wanna start my own lab, but it's fairly similar to um, an academic postdoc. 
Makes sense. Great. Okay. Um, Chin Yi Lu, I think I see your hand raised. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I have a question. So, like, what advice we give and uh, like balance? How do you like balance like all the different like interests and goals? And also, what advice would you give to like undergrad students who are about to transition to like upper like upper grad? Upper grad. Okay. Um, I think your first question was just how do I balance everything? Yeah. That, um, honestly, it's just communication. I think during grad school, as long as I had everything, like Tim was always aware of the activities I was doing as far as the teaching and my involvement with the career um, development um, uh, uh, opportunities with the bread office. So it's important you communicate. So my PI now is also aware that what my career goals are. And so it's just a matter of knowing what they, them being aware and knowing like, okay, on this particular day, I'm not in office or, um, or um, also um, um, just writing down like, okay, on this day, this is what I do. I keep a fairly like organized schedule. It's not always like, we know science can go awry. So it, I don't have to stick to it, but I have a general outline. So especially like if I'm doing a Western and it takes two hours to run and I don't have any other lab activity to do, then I would work on PMP um, coursework. So it's just kind of that balance and communicating and um, making sure I have what I need to do done as far as bench work. And your second question was advice to undergraduates. Um, I think my biggest advice is doing what you do now. Like you're communicating with people who are in a position that you may wanna be in. You're asking questions, you're figuring life out. Um, I think that's my biggest advice. Just don't be afraid to introduce yourself to those people and ask the questions that you have. Thank you. I've got one more question and then we'll go to Zach. Um, so you you in searching out for this next opportunity for you it, it it seemed like you had big picture goals about what you were looking for rather than a specific idea of what you wanted for your postdoc yeah do you feel like that's uh did you feel that was true for your cohort in general or w how were you the same or unique from others that you see who have gone on um i feel like that's pr that was pretty standard, at least among my friend group. Um, I know a couple of people who are doing fellowships with um, biotech companies and also um, who went on to traditional postdocs and they just knew what type of experiences they wanted. Like I have a friend who wanted more immunology experience when she had a neuroscience background. So she chose a neuroimmunology lab. So she knew what she wanted to look for and what type of projects she wanted. So it was kind of you don't necessarily know specifics what you want to do or what the lab has available as far as projects. So I do think it's good to go in with an open mind, um, but definitely have your your list of requirements. That's great. Thank you so much. I think sometimes it feels like there's a path that's supposed to be carved out for you. And that's not true. You make your own path with what you're looking for. So thank yeah. you for illustrating that. <laughs> and uh, before I go, I just want to say I have my email address here. So if we didn't get to your questions, feel free to email me or send me a message on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. So good to see you. I appreciate you. Me too. <laughs> Check out our website to find recordings of all of our videos. We'll get them posted about a week after each of the presentations. We can't wait to see you.